you'll see how there's one or two, one or two uh, links with the things that I've mentioned there. So the book of Acts, let's have a think about the, the overall structure of it. Chapters one to seven are really to do with, with, with the Jewish nation particularly. You remember how that the Lord Jesus, when he spoke in chapter one, he said this in verse number eight, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utmost part of the earth. The book of Acts is one of those books in the Bible that has a divinely given uh, breakdown to it. When you come across, for example, to the book of Revelation, again, we would have given to us in chapter one uh, an outline of how the rest of the book will divide up. It's interesting too to just have in our minds some simple divisions of, of, of books of the Bible. Um, you think about John's Gospel, for example, and chapters 1 to one to 12 would be the public work of the Lord Jesus, and 13 to 17 would be the, the private work with the, with the disciples, and then you think about 18 to 21 would be the, 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 the crucifixion and resurrection about the book of Romans and you think about chapters 1 to uh, one to 8 would be um, the gospel and then 9 to 11 where does that leave Israel and 12 to 16 is the practical outcome from it. And it's good to have in our minds these basic divisions of the books of different books of the Bible mainly so that we we take things in their context. Context being the key interpretive tool that we have and if we just have in our minds a broad outline of, of, of a book of the Bible then we know where individual chapters will slot in and as it were the flow or the story across the whole book. In chapters 1 to 7 we have the gospel going out to Jerusalem and Judea. In chapters 8, 9, 10 and 11 are, are a real transition uh, in, the, in the book. Of course in chapter Eight, as we have read, the gospel is going to the Samaritans and then to the Ethiopian. And of course, we have the conversion of uh, Saul to become Paul. He's going to be the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles in particular. Before then, in chapters 12, for the rest of the book, the gospel is going to be going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. We see a number of transitions that, that take place in those in those. Uh, chapters there in, in 8 to 11. We go from Jerusalem being the, the, the centre to going out to the whole world and really uh, Antioch becomes more important and we see too the change from Peter to Paul in terms of who the key characters are. And these chapters in, in 8 to 11 are really critical in terms of that transition that is taking place. But as we read earlier, it wasn't straightforward for those that were involved, for those characters, for those individuals like Philip, like Ananias, like Peter. It must have seemed quite confusing at the time. As I say, my overall exercise really for speaking about the speaking this evening is to give that sense of encouragement that even when it seems confusing, it seems that we can't quite work out what God is doing, just to be encouraged that God does have an overall plan for what he is accomplishing. And he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's have a think about Philip and just really focus in upon him and see what practical lessons there are for us to learn from chapter 8. You'll notice how that I think Philip must have already grasped what Peter was going to need rather more help to understand in chapters 10 and 11. Philip is somebody who's willing to not only speak to the Samaritans, but indeed, even though the Ethiopian had been worshipping up in Jerusalem, here is somebody who is really a Gentile. And we see that it really is this gradual shift from the gospel going out exclusively to Jews up to the point where they reject Stephen and, 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 and stone him. The gospel up to that point has been going exclusively to Jews, but now it's going to go out into the Gentile world and indeed from that the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples really starts to be seen but it's interesting to see that philip also is willing to look at things in perhaps a different way to what we might naturally from a from, from a human perspective not only is he willing to go out to to the gentile uh, world and speak to speak to gentiles 
we see somebody who is just under the control of the spirit of god and while he's been preaching in samaria to a crowd and, and, and great multitudes are being blessed he's also somebody who's willing to go and speak to an individual here is somebody who he's not concerned about what the numbers look like what he's concerned about is being under the control direction and leading of the spirit of god we also see somebody who's willing to to run if that's what god wants him to do and who's willing to ride in the chariot now i i, I um you'll, you'll be able to uh, just see my face on the screen uh, maybe if you could see the whole of me you'll see you you would say steve uh, i we, i can tell which you would prefer to do and you'd prefer to be riding in the chariot than running perhaps and maybe looking at the faces on the screen, maybe uh, for some of you uh, through dint of age, that might be what you would prefer as well. But here was Philip who was willing to run if that was what God said. And he was willing to have a right if that was what God said. Here is somebody who will be able in the same conversation to deal with prophecy from the Old Testament and speak about baptism from the new. Here is somebody who, when he finds himself with a stranger is not long before he's looking to find a way to speak to them about the word of God. Now it's a passage that uh, we particularly like because it's probably the nearest that you get to airport chaplaincy uh, that's the work close to our hearts, um, the closest that you get to it in the Bible you know. Here is somebody on an international journey and he uh, just uh, is confused and he's uncertain going back to his homeland and we find that god just has somebody who is brought alongside them for just that short period of time they've never met them before and they're never gonna going to see them again and just for a short period of time they have opportunity to journey with them and share with them something of the good word of god it's interesting to notice that Philip is focused on the Lord Jesus. Um, we could have read how that in verse number five, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ on to them. We notice that when Philip will speak to the Ethiopian, in verse number 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Here was somebody who was focused on the Lord Jesus. And isn't that a great thing? We can speak with people about so many things, can't we? And uh, you know, if somebody asks our opinion on COVID, we'll probably have one. And if somebody asks us where we've been on holiday, well, we'll be glad to tell them about that, no doubt. But here is Philip. And even when we think about what we could speak to people about spiritually, there's plenty we could say about the state of the world, couldn't we? And maybe we have our favorite topics in the scriptures. But he is focused on speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Good thing to do, isn't it? To point people to the Savior. Now, it's not to say that he did it in exactly the same way. You'll know that the word Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. And it's interesting that he speaks about that, particularly to those from Samaria. And yet to this Ethiopian who presumably, even if he was uh, you know, interested in Judaism and had been up to the temple and so on, we don't really know how much he, he understood. He certainly didn't seem to understand what he was reading in Isaiah 53. And so he speaks to him about Jesus, the Savior. And it's a good thing, isn't it, to be mindful of our audience. We don't always know, do we, on Zoom quite who's listening. And when we think about the great ways that we've been able to use the technology over the last couple of years, uh, yeah, recording will be put online and sometimes we don't know just for sure who's going to come across that and the Lord can use that in wonderfully sovereign ways. But there is flexibility, isn't there, within the gospel to know a bit about our audience and to think about what will help them in their understanding of spiritual things. It's good, isn't it, to just have that sensitivity to those that we're speaking to and be able to present the Lord Jesus to them in a way that will be helpful, in a way that they will understand. And it's a good thing, isn't it, as we now go into uh, another phase, um, whether it's post-COVID or not, uh, will remain to be seen. But nevertheless, we're, we're into at the next stage, aren't we, of where there are fewer limitations on what we can do. How are we going to use that for the Lord? I, I, I feel quite strongly that there is a real risk that we have um, 
got out of the habit of perhaps certain things that we used to do quite routinely um, because COVID has put, re put restrictions on us. And we certainly need to be thinking about um, what does the Lord want us to go back to doing that we were doing before? So perhaps hospitality and, and, and making sure that we're with people and being kind to them and spending time alongside them and so on. What is there that we have perhaps done that we hadn't done before during COVID and the use of the technology and so on to spread the gospel? And of course, there will be things there that the Lord wants us to carry on doing. Different people able to be reached in different ways and yet to be focused on the Lord Jesus, the one who the world needs so much. Philip wasn't distracted by the horses. What do I mean by that? You may know that Philip's name means lover of horses. And uh, I suspect that the, uh, the Ethiopian here, he probably had some nice, quite horses, quite nice horses if they're gonna get all the way from uh, Israel down to Egypt. I, I guess they must have had a bit of endurance or maybe they swapped horses along the way, I don't know. But anyway, I am sure that uh, this, this important person wasn't making do with uh, the, the sort of the, 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 the least good pony that there was going of the day. I suspect he had good horses. We don't know whether or not Philip was true to his name and loved horses, um, but let's pretend for a moment he did. He had something far more important to talk about than horses, didn't he? He had the saviour to speak about. And if you got talking to me for any length of time, you'd find out that I quite like aeroplanes and uh, I can I could talk to you about aviation for a little while. And uh, you know, I did 15 years in, in the industry and my dad was in the industry, too. And well, yeah, I have to admit, I did even look up uh, what flights Newquay had going in and out uh, today, just the one up to up to Gatwick. Um, but you're in good company. Uh, because there's quite a few uh, American airports, you know, those big ones on the eastern seaboard uh, in New York and Boston and so on. I think they've only got about one flight going in and out today because of the really atrocious weather they've got. So you're in good company. But, you know, I often have to remind myself at, at the airport, I'm not there to talk about aeroplanes or anything else really that in, is of interest to me. We've got a bigger thing to do, haven't we, in our lives? And it's a real challenge, isn't it? What do we spend our time talking to people about? And yes, we might break the ice or we might find things in common to start up a conversation. But we have got this wonderful message, haven't we? This great and glorious gospel. And it's a real um, challenge to us to be looking for those opportunities to speak to men and women and boys and girls about the Saviour and all that the gospel can do uh, in blessing them and being for the glory of God. Now, Philip had to leave behind his reputation, didn't he? I don't know whether he, by this stage he had a mission board or anything of that type to answer to, but you can imagine the sort of report that would have to go back. Uh, Philip, you, you, left, um, you, you left a successful preaching campaign. Um, there must have been a good reason for doing that. You must have, you must have seen tremendous blessing. Well, I, I went down into the desert. I mean, why did you do that for Philip? Uh, who did you expect to find in the desert? Well, I, I found one person and they did get converted or just the one. Did you do any follow up work with them? Well, the Lord had me put somewhere else uh, and they went on their way. It wouldn't be something to judge, would it? By normal human estimation. I'm not knocking by the way doing things with crowds. There can be opportunity to do that. Follow-up work would normally be a really important part of what we do when folk are blessed and saved. But Philip just left his reputation and what others would think of his service with God. What mattered to him was that he was being led and directed by the Spirit. I notice also that Philip didn't ask too many questions about resources. If God sends you into the desert, you could well be expected to ask a few questions. You know, Lord, what am I gonna do? You know, there's not very many Tesco's, are there, or whatever your local supermarket might be, you know, just down the road in the desert. And he goes into the desert, trusting God to provide everything that he's going to need. He also not only leaves his reputation and the resources, but also the results with God. And this one man is, is blessed. And goes on his way rejoicing and Philip never sees him again. And you wonder, don't you, what that man did in taking the gospel to Ethiopia. We don't know for sure. And yet we like to think, don't we, that this man was part of God's plan and purpose for spreading the gospel that little bit further. 
and in the sovereign purposes of God, we see how that in different ways, God was at work, even though Philip didn't see very much of it in that initial time. I know that you're from a variety of different backgrounds and different places on the call today. Uh, certainly my experience of being down in uh, Cornwall is that it can be a tough place to serve God. And it can be, can be difficult from the times when I've been down and visited churches, you know, quite spread out perhaps geographically, and uh, maybe not what they used to be years ago. But God is still at work, isn't he? We have a God who is not finished with the work that he is doing. So how do we know God's will for our lives? I just want to conclude in the last few minutes, just will for our lives. As we go into, as it were, the next phase of what God has ahead for us, it's right, isn't it, that we be before him as to how does he want us to use the situation that we're in? How does he want us to go forward? What does he want us to do, whether as churches or as individuals? And it's a big subject, isn't it, as to how we know that spirit guidance in our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm not coming at this either from the point of view of pretending it's easy, because there are times when we'll be there at Heathrow Airport and pre-COVID, 80 million passengers a year went through Heathrow Airport, 80,000 staff. It's about half of that in terms of passenger numbers at the moment. But there would be plenty of times when we would just stand and look at a crowd of people and say, Lord, who is it you want me to help? Who's the person do you need me to speak to? You could look around and there could be many people who you could think, well, I could go and speak to them or they look like they need some help. And other times when you go down a corridor and four terminals at Heathrow, you can imagine it's a huge place. And Lord, do you want me to go left here or go right here? And it's often when you look back at the end of a day, when you see the way that the Lord was overruling and leading. I don't think it's easy, but neither too do I think it is something that we should reserve purely for the big decisions in life. I absolutely believe that day to day we should be seeking to have a sensitivity to the Spirit's guidance and leading. Then in the day to day things that we are doing, we would be under the Spirit's control in just the way that, that Philip was. Can I give you some principles just to leave with you to think about? Uh, there's quite a bit of text on the screen, but that's mainly because uh, I'm conscious that uh, this is a subject where we need to be clear about the verses that we're going to as well uh, for it. You can alliterate them all with S's if, if you wish, but um, first of all, am I really interested in knowing God's will for my life? It comes back uh, right at the start, doesn't it, to this desire in my heart, do I want to know his will? Remember those well-known words in Proverbs 3, in all thy, your ways acknowledge him. Uh, and it challenges me, do I want to know God's will in every single part of my life? Or is it just that, well, Lord, I, I want your guidance when there's that big critical decision to make. But the rest of the time, I'd like to just you know, go about doing what I want to do. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The Lord Jesus was our perfect example, wasn't he? You remember how that in coming into the world, he said, lo, I am come to do your will, O oh my God. You remember how that during his lifetime, he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And you remember how that there, uh, in connection with his death, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And the amazing way that in his coming, in his life, and in his dying, it was all about the will of God. That's a real challenge, isn't it? To, am I as that determined that it will be about him and not about me? You remember how the Paul would speak, if the Lord permits, we will do this and that. James will make reference to it. Are, are our plans, whatever they might be, are we willing to have them be subject to the will of God? What about sin in our lives? You see, sin is the disobedience to the will of God, isn't there? Uh, and we can think about it in, in both ways. There can be this sense that I can be going against what I know is the will of God. And if I'm sinning and doing something that I know I shouldn't, how can I then be asking God to guide and lead me? Likewise too, if I haven't yet done what I know is the will of God, that's a, a sin of a different kind, a sin of omission rather than commission. Uh, and likewise too, I need to get on and do what I know is the will of God for me in order to be able to pray regarding the next steps. Mentioning prayer there, of course, prayer is absolutely essential in terms of knowing the will of God. 
And uh, even the most amazing of sat navs that we now have, uh, two of our children are now driving cars. And uh, you think about all the things that our parents spoke to us about in terms of um, you know the things to carry in the car. And uh, our children go off driving without a map. And uh, I don't think they've got a map in their car at all. Very used to just using the sat nav. And phones are amazing in terms of the guidance that they give. But even the most amazing of phones still needs to be asked, doesn't it? You know, give me directions to here or there. And I wonder if there are times in my life where I would need to know the guidance of God, and yet I'm not asking him. How important that we do come before him and pray and keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on praying until the Lord guides and gives directions. A number of times, at many, many times at Heathrow, probably happens every shift, we see people looking perplexed, that they're confused as to what to do. And we go up to them and say, can I help you? Oh, yes, you can. And, and, and they're asked the question, uh, please, can you tell me where such and such is? And you're just glad that they were willing to ask. But until they did, you couldn't really help them. And how important that we are before the Lord asking him as to what he wants us to do. Now, of course, the scriptures have plenty to say in terms of the will of God. And there are direct commands. And even some of them would very helpfully say this is the will of God. And we could think of those in terms of living pure lives from a moral perspective, but also to perhaps more day to day and practical things like giving thanks. And it's interesting, isn't it? This contrast between 1 Thessalonians 4 that will speak about living a pure life, that that's the will of God. And we would expect it to say that. But 1 Thessalonians 5 will speak about giving thanks in everything as being the will of God. It's good, isn't it, to have a thankful spirit? And there are these direct commands of Scripture that tell us something of the will of God. And we don't need any more guidance and leading, do we? When there's a direct command in Scripture, we can just get on and do it and know that that's the will of God. But also, too, there are principles in the word of God. Things like doing everything for his glory, being a good example to others, being wise, using our time well, thinking about how we'll need to answer to the Lord for how we've used our money and our gifts, seeking to be like the Lord Jesus in the way that we conduct ourselves. And then there's the spirit itself, of which Philip is a good example. Romans 8 speaks about, for as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. Every Christian indwelt by the Spirit of God from the moment of conversion. And you remember how that uh, just, uh, just in, in that same passage in Romans, it says, if anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Remember how the Galatians will say, because you are sons, God has sent forth his Spirit into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the wonder of the indwelling Spirit of God, that you and I, uh, as, as those that are saved uh, by the grace of God, have a member of the Godhead living within. It's, it's remarkable, isn't it? That's just beyond our, our ability to comprehend. The, a member of the Godhead dwelling within the child of God. And how tremendous. And then when we think, well, I need some guidance. I need some help in my life as to what to do. We couldn't have anything more wonderful, could we, than the Spirit of God within us. Now, his leading, of course, will never be contrary to the direct command of Scripture. The spirit that inspired the word of God is the same spirit that is within the believer. But I take it that one of the things with having the spirit of God within us is that he will give a serenity, a, a peace when we are in the will of God. And we maybe don't be able to quite explain it. But there will be this sense in which the spirit of God and our spirit are at one. And there is that sense of peace and tranquility as we have sought the mind and will of God, and he is guided and led, and we see him uh, leading and, and giving us that sense of peace. Now, circumstances, and you'll say, Steve, that doesn't begin with S, and uh, I wasn't much good at spelling at school, but uh, I, I, I don't think that um, that's uh, a bad thing, because circumstances we have to be so very, very careful with. They can often be interpreted in more than one way. And I would suggest to you that they are best reflected on sometime later rather than in the situation. 
We may see God's hand in the circumstances confirming the thing, but the problem with using circumstances to actually determine the will of God is that so often the way that you might interpret the circumstance is different to the way that I would. Let me give you a couple of Bible examples, not from the sphere of flying, but from the nautical sphere. When Jonah was going against the will of God, he found a boat that was going the way that he wanted to go. And Jonah could have said, well, isn't that remarkable? I, 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 I want to go this particular direction. It just happens to be a boat going where I want to go. Conversely, Paul was in the will of God when he got in that ship to go to Rome, and yet he was shipwrecked. And you can imagine Paul as he's bobbing up and down there in the Mediterranean, uh, just as they're making their way to the, the, the land there at Malta. Uh, can you imagine him say, thinking, am I in the will of God? Did I expect this to be part of what would happen? You imagine somebody could have said to him, Paul, are you sure? It was this the way that you expected to get to Rome, having to swim? And yet he absolutely was in the will of God. So easily we can look at the circumstances of our lives. And we tend to presume that if we're in the will of God, then life will be going more easily or life will be going more smoothly. And I think it would be fair to say that there are times when the opposite is actually true. Those that will live godly will suffer persecution, for example. And it can often be the way that if we're in the will of God, life can actually be that bit, bit tougher and that bit more difficult. Now, correctly discerning God's will in one part of my life doesn't guarantee that I have it right in all parts of my life. I think this is a big uh, help, isn't it, in not getting too proud about things. We may well have accurately determined the Lord's will in our lives regarding perhaps who we marry or where we should live. And it's good, isn't it? when we have the assurance that that is right. However, it doesn't change the fact that a new day will bring new challenges and new circumstances that will need us to just seek to know his leading and guiding. Maybe you're saying, well, I like to be like Gideon. I, I like to put out some fleece uh, to try and work out what God's will is. And again, I would just, well, if that's the way you do things, that's between you and the Lord. But the only thing I would just say is that you remember what Gideon did, certainly the second time, it was genuinely miraculous. Don't be asking God for things that, you know, can easily be misinterpreted or that could easily just happen anyway. When God has given us the indwelling Holy Spirit, I take it that he wants us to use that rather than really looking for signs. And you notice that even with Gideon, he did it once. That wasn't enough. He needed another one done. And he was really using it, I think, for confirmation anyway. He already had God's word to him to tell him what to do. And it's, uh, it is important that we base what we're doing on scripture rather than on experience. Just to give you an example of the distinction I'm trying to make there. Uh, our daughter was recently out in a Christian school in Cyprus, uh, serving the Lord there. And it was over several months, actually, that the Lord had guided and led that that was the Lord's will uh, for her to go and do that. And that came about through prayer and through the Spirit's guidance and through various other things. When she had made that decision and uh, she had been in contact with the head teacher out there of that Christian school, he said, ah, that's very interesting. I've just been contacted by one of the uh, members of staff who's got to go and have uh, a medical procedure and was very concerned for what we were going to do for, for cover while she was having that procedure. And that's what our daughter covered for the first few weeks that she was out there. It wasn't that we used that piece of information to determine the Lord's will, but it was just nice and confirmatory once the decision had been taken. Some years ago, when we were just coming to the point in our, in our life's experience where we had believed that God had guided us to leave a full-time employment. This was on the Friday and we'd finally come to the decision. Many years of, of the Lord's leading had, had led up to that point. And we prayed on that Friday that over the weekend, we would have the confidence to just stay firm to it. So that on the Monday, I could go and speak to my boss about it. I would hand in my notice, work my three months notice uh, up to the end of September. This was in the July. We were busy doing, uh, giving out leaflets at the Olympics 
uh, back in 2012. Well, on the Saturday, having prayed for the Lord to keep us firm and strong over the weekend, uh, the, 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 an email came from some Christians we know a few miles away from here. And they said, Steve, we'd like you to come and do two weeks of children's work, please. This is in October. We don't know how you're going to sort that out with your work because we know you've got a busy job, uh, but we just feel led to ask you to come and do that. Uh, just wonderfully confirmatory from the Lord. Uh, we weren't using it to determine his leading, but it was just an encouragement to us. They didn't know what our plans were. And of course, it was going to work out just nicely that having finished work in the September, we'd just be free to do that in the October. The Lord will sometimes confirm things. But when it comes to his leading and his guidance, it's good to use the scriptures, good to use the spirit, good to use the sanctuary, good to have the right uh, attitude regarding a sin. Uh, perhaps sometimes we can use the saints for advice. We need to be careful about circumstance. I hope that that might just be an encouragement to us. I appreciate it's not easy determining the Lord's will in our lives and uh, looking at some of the ages uh, on the uh, screen in front of me. I'm quite sure that you would tell me it doesn't necessarily get any easier, Steve. Uh, the older we get on in the Christian life, we always, don't we, need to be before the Lord for his guidance and for his leading. We need to be patient, don't we? Wait upon the Lord and he will guide in his time. We don't know the whole picture in advance. I take it that there will be things that will get to heaven and to the extent that the Lord deigns to graciously give us any explanation for what he was doing in our lives because of course he doesn't owe us that does he? To the extent that he does we will look back and say he did all things well. He was working things out perfectly. Our God and I say it reverently has never made a mistake in eternity. And he's not going to start with our little lives today, is he? He is infinitely practiced at upholding the universe perfectly. He knows what he is doing and he is able completely to work his plans and purposes out. We may not see the whole picture, but he does. The Israelites day by day were guided by that pillar, cloud and fire, day and night for those 40 or so years. And I take it that it's wonderful encouragement to us to obey the next steps that God is giving to us. And then in due course, we may see that the whole plan is brought before us. I do like those words in Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yes, it's a lamp to our feet to take the next step. And then when we take the next step and take the next step and take the next step, that we'll then look back and see how it was a light to our path overall. Let's come back to where we were, where we started. Um, have we, I, I wasn't putting it up as a learning objective. Some of you will know uh, from school, perhaps some teaching work, that it's good to set out where you're trying to go and then reflect at the end as to whether or not you got there. Let's just come back to where we were trying to go today remind ourselves of where we read in those chapters in Acts. As individuals, Philip, Ananias, Saul, Peter, Cornelius, for these people, day-to-day -day life in the things that we've read about were changing. They may have seemed confusing. They challenged things that they had thought before, and they had to trust the day-by-day -day guidance of God. And now as we look back, we see how it perfectly fits into the big picture structure of the book of Acts. And we see what God was doing in taking the spread of the gospel from being just to the Jews in chapters 1 to 7, to then going out to the wider parts of the whole earth in the later chapters of Acts. And it's these chapters in 8, 9 and 10 where really this transformation is taking place. I appreciate the day-to-day -day life may feel confusing at times. It's changing, isn't it? Maybe challenging. Yet we have a God who is in absolute control. Now, as we seek to just be sensitive to his leading and to his guiding day by day, I trust we'll be encouraged to be reminded that there'll come a day when his overall plans and purposes will have been seen 
to have been worked out. And as we thought particularly about Philip, may we have a willingness to seek to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance day by day. Let's just pray and commend ourselves to the Lord. Our gracious God, we give our thanks for the wonderful things that there are in your word. How we marvel that we haven't been left here to just, uh, as it were, pick our way through the fog of life. We marvel to think a member of the Godhead to indwell each one of your people and how we would ask that we would be helped in challenging and changing days, in days where perhaps we wonder about the future of our country. We pray our God for the moral and spiritual deterioration that we're saddened to see around us and how we long that it, there would be those even in our own country that would turn back to you and that the gospel would transform lives and may our god there be that which is done for your glory even before the lord jesus returns we pray for each one who has joined the call you know the individual needs our god and we pray that we would be helped and encouraged to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance day by day. Bless us, we pray. So we thank you for the opportunity and privilege of enjoying your word together in this way. And we just commit one another into your love and your care in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.